Today's guest on Crystal Storytellers Podcast is General Anthony Zini, retired United States Marine Corps four-star general, former commander-in-chief for the United States Central Command, and former special envoy to Israel and Palestinian Authority. I miss active duty greatly. I had a 40-year career, and uh, it was hard to take the uniforms off. It took me six months to put them away until my <laughs> wife says, what are you going to do with those? <laughs> you must wear them for weddings or a special occasions. I, I've only worn my uniform to my daughter's weddings, you know, uh-huh. and... Uh, and my son's wedding, and you know, it, uh, that's the only time. You know, we, usually when you're retired, you first of all, it's hard to fit in them. <laughs> Get ready to set sail with General Anthony Zinni as he shares fascinating personal stories with Crystal Symphony's cruise director. To earn any level of advancement in our military is both an honor and a privilege for the talented men and women of our distinguished armed services. It is a particular significant achievement to rise to the level of general, especially under the lifelong dedication of 40 years of service. Hi, I'm Russ Thomas Grieve, Cruise Director on the Crystal Symphony, and today it is my pleasure to speak with General Anthony Zini, retired United States Marine Corps four-star general, former commander-in-chief for the United States Central Command, and former special envoy to Israel and the Palestinian Authority. General Zini is a decorated general with graduate degrees in international relations and management as well as honorary doctorates from prestigious universities and academies. General Zini has written three best-selling books, Battle Ready, The Battle for Peace, and Before the First Shots Are Fired, covering his military career and experience in foreign affairs. He has served on numerous advisory boards for a range of companies with diverse areas of focus. Among his most critical assessments of military activities is his prescient testimony to Congress covering the extreme terrorism and Osama bin Laden in 2000, a year before the actions of 9-11. General Zini joins us on a 17-day Hong Kong to Tokyo cruise aboard the Crystal Symphony. Welcome to the Crystal Storytellers podcast, General Zini. Thank you for sailing with us, and thank you for your distinguished military service. Well, thank you, Russ. It's good to be with you. Excellent. Well, there's a lot I want to cover today, so let's jump right in, all okay. right? Uh, you were born to middle-class American parents of Italian descent during the Second World War. How did growing up in post-war America influence your decision to join the military, and what made you choose the Marine Corps? Well, my, my father, uh, actually my parents were immigrants to this country. My father, when he came, was drafted in the U.S. Army and fought in World War I. I had cousins that fought in the Second World War and uh, my brother in the Korean War. So serving in the military was part of the tradition of my family. Virtually every male in my family served, and usually in wartime. So it was natural for me to think that uh, and certainly believe that I would serve and wanted to. It was a sense of duty and My father instilled in me the idea this was a responsibility you had to our country, for him, his new country. So it was a a natural thing. So you grew up in a military household, and it just was second nature for you. Yes. I mean, they weren't career military, but they felt that this was part of being an American citizen. And uh, my first day on campus, I was the youngest child, the only one to go to college. And uh, college was all new to me. I was a commuter student, and I saw this these two Marines standing there with posters, and it looked exciting. I had a brother-in-law that was a Marine, and it sounded like a challenge, so I joined. So while I was in college, I went away in the summers. I was in the reserves. And then when I graduated, I was commissioned a second lieutenant. And, of course, uh, just as I got in, the Vietnam War flared up. Uh, So I did two tours in Vietnam and really liked the Marine Corps, liked the military life. Uh, My wife is uh, the daughter of a... A Navy officer, so she liked the military life too, and it was a natural to stay in. So, after you left Vietnam, mm-hmm. how long before you went back to Vietnam? Uh, I, when my first tour of duty in Vietnam was 1967. Mm-hmm. I was an advisor with the Vietnamese Marines, which was an interesting experience. I wore their uniform, spoke their language, I'd gone to language school. And the second time I went back was 1970, so there was about three years in between first and second tour. Have you been back to modern-day Vietnam? I have not. And, you know, uh, it's a strange feeling. I'm not sure I can. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I had so many friends that were lost, not only uh, U.S. Marines, and I commanded a company there and some of my own Marines, but uh, also my Vietnamese friends, the people I lived with. We lived in the villages. I saw all of Vietnam. So it's a very personal thing for me. Absolutely. Did any of your family achieve the rank of general as you? 
Uh, no, no, my my family were all uh, enlisted. You know, okay. we had some proud corporals and sergeants, but I was the only one that became an officer, and, and then eventually, obviously, a general. So, did Dad? Uh, did he see you become general? No, uh, my father was much older. As I said, I came a long way late in life. Uh, I think I I'd made lieutenant colonel before uh, he passed away. Uh, but just being commissioned an officer, he was very proud. I mean, it meant a lot to him. Uh, and, and so that experience was great. My brother, who has passed away much older, uh, did get to see me. You know, That's great. on the stars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you've experienced multiple missions spanning a range of decades. Uh, first as a battalion advisor in the Vietnam mm-hmm. War, which we chatted about. Then commander. Then uh, heading a special operations uh, and terrorism, among other roles and positions. How... Has modern warfare evolved over these uh, past four decades? And and what does the future of the battle look like um, on the ground and in the air? I, I think we're, since Vietnam, and including Vietnam, uh, the, the, the form of warfare, if you will, has changed a lot. It, it's uh, what, what the military terms hybrid warfare. It's not all conventional. It's uh, you'll, You could experience some conventional fighting during a war, at the same time uh, insurgency, same time terrorism, same time conducting humanitarian uh, operations. And so it's this mix and blend we've seen in Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. My son's a Marine officer, and he's now in Afghanistan on his fourth tour there and spent a couple tours in Iraq. Uh, and the form of warfare he's seeing is much uh, aligned with uh, what we saw beginning in Vietnam and carried over into these conflicts. Wow. And, uh, with uh, Iran sort of being the front focus right now, I think uh, we all are uh, just wondering what's going to happen here in the future with that. I, I think uh, you know it does present a problem, but I think we're less likely to see warfare in the form we saw, conventional warfare, nation states against each other. It might be less likely because of the technology and lethality of the weapon systems. We're going to see more of this kind of, uh, I don't want to say low-intensity conflict, because if you're in that fight, it's not low-intensity, and sometimes it could actually measure up to being a full conventional warfare. It's going to be very confusing. It's a hearts and minds kind of uh, conflict that we find ourselves in, and, and we have to pay much more attention to things like collateral damage and relationship with the people that we're dealing with. I think we're going to see conflict uh, go into the cities more and more. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're becoming an urbanized species, and more people live in cities. I know the military is looking at how we conduct operations, deal with conflicts in urbanized terrain, or what we call urbanized terrain, cities. So it's going to be a much, much more difficult environment. Going into the cities, that means more loss of life, doesn't it? Uh, it, it does, but you have to be very careful, obviously. It puts a high uh, degree of, of stress on uh, small unit commanders. You obviously do not want to harm innocents. They're, they're going to be there in great numbers. It's going to be hard to pick out who the enemies are. It's much more challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been to Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq doing assessments since I retired, and uh, I've seen the stress it puts on our young sergeants and captains. Uh, we try to adhere certainly to the conventions and to the rules of engagement, uh, but we're challenged by enemies that don't adhere to those and try to push us into situations where we would, you know, where they would hope we were forced to violate in some ways, and 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 that creates a, a, a demand on those young leaders that probably we haven't seen before. Do you miss active duty? I miss active duty greatly. I have a 40-year career, and uh, mm-hmm. it was hard to take the uniforms off. It took mm-hmm. me six months to put them away until my <laughs> wife says, what are you going to do with those? <laughs> you must wear them for weddings or special occasions, don't I, you? I've only worn my uniform to my daughter's weddings you uh-huh. know, and, uh, and my son's wedding. And, you know, it, uh, that's the only time. You know, we, Usually when you're retired, you're... First of all, it's hard to fit in them. <laughs> Too Age much takes good time. Toll, huh? Yeah, yeah these crystal cruises are killing me. <laughs> we got good food. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh well, do you have a mentor or uh, or a particularly um, dedicated commanding officer that meant a lot to you? I, I do, and as a matter of fact, I have had several. Uh, one in particular that became the commandant of our Marine Corps, uh, uh, General Al Gray, legendary. But there were many others. Uh, I was fortunate coming up in the Marine Corps that. Uh, commanding officers I had uh, were mentors in, in the full sense of the term. They cared about us. They, they, they cared about our development. They cared about our welfare. They were certainly uh, treated, you know, our families extremely well. So, I, I, I got. I have to say, one of the reasons I stayed so long was because of the leadership and because mm-hmm. of that 
a mentor, uh, what one of our commandants once said, it has to be a father-son relationship or a, a teacher-scholar relationship. Of course, now we would say a mother-daughter, too. <laughs> That's true, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Many more women in the military yeah, this m- day. Much more, and they're doing extremely well. Uh, so, so is uh, Mr. Gray still in your Rolodex? Yes, he is, and he's 96, I think, now. Good yeah, for yeah, him. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, given the intensity of recent activities and uh, the rise of modern terrorism, mm-hmm. How do you foresee the future of diplomacy coupled with our ongoing military presence in these countries? You know, uh, we obviously study Clausewitz, a famous uh, you know military theorist, and he said that warfare is basically politics by other means. What we're finding more and more is that uh, we need a whole government approach to conflict. It's not just a matter of employing the military. It's diplomacy. It's our economic power. It's our social influence, values influence. Uh, Colin Powell, another person that I admire and think of as a mentor, had really really said that we need to engage in this whole of government, overwhelming force, not meaning just military force. Mm-hmm. We have to use our diplomats. We have to use our economic power. We have to use our, our value system and, and, and our social systems uh, that have a great deal of influence around the world and make people want to uh, copy what we are and, and act as we do. So it can't be a one-punch thing where it's only military. Have you ever thought of serving the country in, uh, in another way? And, and well, I have. I've, I've, I've uh, been a diplomat. Uh, uh, my specialty, if you will, is uh, me- peace mediation work. I've done the uh, for Secretary Powell. I did the Israeli-Palestinian mediation and a number of others. So uh, I, I find that very rewarding. It, it seems like a contradiction that somebody was in the military so long and application of force. I'm now applying, you know, mediation and negotiation. And, uh, you know, uh, it's much more difficult, believe me. How much longer do you want to do this? Uh, You know, as long as uh, two brain cells are rubbing together, uh, you know, and reasonably have uh, a memory that uh, that functions and works and physically able, uh, I feel it's a responsibility and a duty, not only to our country and our nation, but to, you know, humanity. I'm glad to do it. And you are go, go, go all the time anyway, for, for you to stop would probably not be an answer. Yes, and I also <laughs> teach, and uh, I, love, I love being around young students on college campuses. Uh, so, I mean, I think that helps keep me young. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree. All right, this is a very topical question here. Given the nature of the geopolitical and now the digital political world, mm-hmm. it's modern warfare going to be limited by borders, armies, and political are- uh, agreements when rogue insurgents can cause significant damage from isolated computer Centers. I think this has uh, created a whole new dimension to the way we have to deal with conflict. We're going to find the battle space includes cyberspace, space, uh, and, and these are dimensions we don't have a lot of experience in. They're going to have to be blended with the familiar forms that we've dealt with before. But increasingly, since the access to, to these kinds of technologies has been so easy uh, for potential enemies to acquire, it adds to the demand that we have. So. By one sense, we're going to be conducting operations much the way we've done for centuries and have to add this other technical uh, dimension to it. So it's going to be a hard combination to meld. I see lately there's a lot about facial recognition. That seems to be sort of the the new thing or Mm -hmm. the thing that will be sort of prevalent in the coming years. I think things like facial recognition and other means of identification are going to become key. We, we might even have weapon systems and others that cannot be operated without that connection, which means they wouldn't have be any utility to, to anybody that stole them or an enemy that captured them. Mm-hmm. So you can see applications for that sort of identification technology that uh, could apply to uh, our systems that we currently have. Wow. All right. Um, do you think the inter-service coordination and multi-element task force coordination of the Marine Corps is at the heart of your unique perspective and management style? Well, I think, you know, in my lifetime, I watched us go from, uh, you know, the, the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. Uh, we operated almost separately, individually. Uh, there was a big emphasis starting with a, a law that was passed in the mid-'80s, the Goldwater-Nichols Act, which required us to become more joint to sort of pool our capabilities to be more efficient and more effective. And I watched that grow over time, and we've gotten to the point now where uh, service identities aren't aren't the key, and they don't pre- restrict us from operating together. It's the capabilities that we've learned to bring together, to meld together, to make us, make us much better. 
And it's something that might be unique to U.S. forces, this sort of what we call joint capability, and the ability to bring in our allies and meld them into this system, which we call combined capability. So this sort of combined joint warfare is something that's evolved over the last few decades into something much more powerful, and for the American taxpayer and others, much more efficient, You know, where mm. services are not operating independently and with duplicate capabilities. Mm. Well, General, you've written several books, and two of them being bestsellers. In the book, The Battle for Peace, you address many of our global challenges with insightful pragmatism. Are your straightforward global engagement strategies achievable with our given governance? Uh, I think it's more difficult. I think, you know, we are, we are not used to the kind of world we face now. Um, the advice I'd given in, in those books are from my experience, not only in, in terms of the military, but my diplomatic experience and other things that I've done that, that, that I've seen require us to approach conflict and to approach challenges to our way of life in, in, a, in a more a cohesive way where we bring in our, our various forms of power, our military power, our economic power, our social power. Uh, we've got to stop being one-punch fighters. Uh, our strength or our global projection around the world is seen by many others as strictly military. We're challenged by nations like China that actually engage in a different way. They, they are investors, businessmen. They connect through uh, infrastructure development. Uh, so we've got to learn to bring all our tools to the table it, 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 what we call all of government or uh, total government involvement and total capacity and, and elements of power. And so that was my advice in the book, The Battle for Peace. And you've written another book before the first shots are fired. Mm -hmm. And it focuses on your passion for deeper engagements in diplomacy, coalition forces, mission accountability, management misjudgments, and policy challenges. Yes. Can a country of our size pivot quickly enough on something as daunting as the scale and depth of our military? Yes, I, th I think we can. I think that though we, we need to learn to be more flexible. Uh, sometimes I think is a knee-jerk reaction in use of the military. Uh, it sounds strange coming from a, a senior military officer, but many of us have felt that uh, our military is too quickly used as the primary source of dealing with conflict when maybe uh, other elements of power could have been used before or in conjunction with. Uh, I watched the employment of our forces in Iraq and Afghanistan and thought we made some classic mistakes that we repeat over and over again. So the book was designed to provide advice as to how to think th through the employment of the military, how to make those decisions, and what the conditions should be for the employment of the military. And I should say, people like Colin Powell and Casper Weinberger, former uh, Secretary of Defense, have, have written sort of a lessons learned kind of list of what we should go through before we make that commitment. And I think we need to go back and adhere to those. We change over administration so fast that sometimes we lose those lessons we have learned in the past. How long did it take you to write the books? A year. Each of them a year? Each a year. The first one a little longer. I did that with Tom Clancy. It was a story of my life and uh, that one took a year and a half but the others a year. Maybe a movie in the works? Oh, yeah. <laughs> with Tom Clancy thinking, you never know. <laughs> yeah, but Tom Cruise plays my part. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Any other books in the future? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm thinking about one, but it, it, it's a major project. If you take it on, you really have to make the commitment. You do. Yeah. We talked about this on uh, the cruise a little earlier, but I think it's kind of interesting to bring it up here on the podcast, and that's um, uh, President Trump is talking about a space force. It's yes. a, you know, it's something different than than our military force. Mm -hmm. It's about space mm -hmm. and creating that. What do you? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think space is an important dimension that we're going to be in, and I think the military has a lot of requirements in space. You know, space-based intelligence systems, our communication systems. We're heavily reliant on it. Uh, what we've done with other functional areas like our strategic command, our nuclear capabilities, our transportation command, our special operations command, is all the services that contributed and we form a, what we call a unified command. I think maybe the president doesn't quite uh, understand how that works. Uh, creating a service would be a tremendous worse, uh, waste of assets and inefficient. Create a command and allow all the services to participate and man that command much the way we do now. We do it on a functional basis, as I said, but we also do it on a regional basis. So, for example, I commanded the U.S. Central Command. There's a European Command, there's a Pacific Command, and others, and all the services provide membership for that. So 
that would be a much more effective and efficient way since we all have a vested interest and requirements that uh, can only be met through space and the systems that we have in space. So if uh, President Trump were to not get reelected, just say, would that be something you think that would fall by the wayside going forward? Or do you think it's something that maybe another president would pick up and take uh, and, and, you know, I be think proactive that, with? I really think that the demands on what we need in space and the way of supporting military operations Potentially, our adversaries that might want to militarize say, uh, space, and we would have to counter that in some way. So I think it's something that, that certainly would go beyond uh, a, a Trump administration to other presidents. But I do think it, it, the advice of the military would be to take this approach of a space command as opposed to a space service. I grew up with the Jetsons. I never dream that I would live to see any of that, but who knows? Yep. You never, never know. All right. We're going to have a little bit of fun right now, okay. General. Okay. Um, first of all, is there anything that you really enjoyed about the ship being here for uh, 17 days? I'll tell you the, you know, I've this is about my 18th uh, crystal uh, cruise, you know, and, and being a part of the enrichment program, the greatest enjoyment I get, and there are many things on this ship that obviously uh, um, uh, are, are enjoyable, is the interaction with the guests. Uh, you know, usually after a lecture, people have questions and comments and come up. And, you know, one thing unique about Crystal is the enrichment program, the lecture series. I hear that all the time, you know, you know for all the lecturers and people that bring in it. It is something that I've had uh, some of the guests say that this is why they, they choose Crystal. But for me, the, the, I enjoy hearing their views and opinions and reactions to what you say. It actually is part of my education. I can safely say I understand where people are coming from or how they react to this. We obviously have a, a, a great uh, group of guests on, on Crystal. They, they come uh, very knowledgeable, uh, very up-to-date on current events. So uh, presenting to them is uh, you have to be at your best in the, because you're going to get the feedback. But I like that personal reaction. That it's one of the highlights of doing this. You are at your best, General, and I have to say that I have heard so many wonderful comments about your lectures. Thank you. So we look forward to having you back on. Great. Little quick fire questions, okay. all right? Uh, current favorite book? I just finished reading a, a book called The uh, the New Silk Roads by Peter Frankopan. Uh, fascinating understanding about where China is going and how they're extending their power throughout the world. Uh, and I think it's worth, it, it, it is a great read and worthwhile uh, the time to, to read it. It's relatively new, fascinating, very interesting, very insightful. Strangest food you've ever eaten? I've eaten both eyeballs of a lamb because uh, as an honored guest, you're expected to eat both. It's bad luck to eat one. My recommendation is don't chew. <laughs> I'm glad they can't see my reaction on the podcast. <laughs> All right. Uh, excellent. Beatles or Rolling Stones? Well, see, my time is before that. I'm, I'm Righteous Brothers. I'm uh, Four Seasons. I'm uh, uh, the Beach Boy. So, you know, when the British invasion came, I was uh, I was out of my teens and on to other things. You were. So it was more, uh, uh, what was it, Sonny and Cher and uh, the Righteous Brothers, would that be a duo to each? Of it, or is that before you? Yeah, and that, uh, Sonny and Cher might have been a little, was a little later, okay. but it was definitely the Righteous Everly Brothers. Everly Brothers and Righteous Everly, Brothers? Definitely. Every, Everly Brothers were Marines. Uh, well, then that's your choice yeah, right it, there. Right. They had some good music, didn't they? They did, they yeah. Did. Uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Trek, and my favorite character was Ensign Jones, and you probably don't remember him. I don't remember that, no. No, w when something bad was happening and they were going to beam down a four-man team, mm -hmm. you can count on Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and Bones. And when Scotty beamed them down, the fourth was always Ensign Jones. Sometimes Ensign Smith. You know he wasn't coming back. <laughs> so I felt, you know, he should have a fan out there. Right. And their General Zini is his fan. Uh, today or tomorrow? Tomorrow. I'm much more, I, I like thinking, acting, planning, strategically, thinking about the future, being positive, not dwelling on today. Today is happening and will happen. Uh, we'll learn from today, but the focus has to be tomorrow. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, you can... Uh, Definitely find General Zini's books on Amazon, absolutely, as well as uh, any of the bookstores uh, in your local town. And I thank you for, uh, first of all, your, your service uh, in, in our military and for keeping our country safe. 
I thank you for your knowledge, your insight that you've given us here uh, on the Crystal Symphony during this cruise, as well as here on this podcast. And uh, we'll look forward to welcoming you back real, real soon. Thank you, Russ. Good to be here. Pleasure. Uh, Thank you for listening. And uh, we have many more great, exciting interviews coming your way. So please stay tuned. So until next time, eat, drink, and be happy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Crystal Storytellers. If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. For more information about upcoming Crystal Sailings, please visit www.crystalcruises.com. See you next week when we are joined by Grammy Award-winning singer, songwriter, and actress, Melissa Manchester.